Hello, everyone. Shall we start? Come on, it's the last one. Try, try to boost your energy, right? Um, if, just even for me, because I came last night all the way from Barcelona, so I don't know if it's 3 a.m. or 6 p.m. today. Um, you know, just to energize a little bit ourselves. Can I ask you to stand up one sec? And sit down if you think that this presentation already is going to be very interesting. <laughs> and the rest can also too. Okay. So um, thank you. Thank you for staying. My talk, um, I'm going to try to present to you the work that we have done in our company, where I have been working for the last five years. For the sake of this uh, relevance for this uh, conference, I'm also an accredited I'm a uh, trainer, and I have I have uh, attended twice to the <laughs> enterprise service planning class, so that probably makes me a good practitioner. Let's see, um, my company, my company is an online travel agency, right? And uh, we are the the biggest in Europe, um, right now probably the third biggest in the world. We are like behind experience Citri. It's called eDreams uh, Odigio. We have around 1,800 employees. We serve around 20 million customers per year. We manage 900 million searches per month. We are in 45 uh, um, countries, 400 engineers. That makes around 30 teams. To put you into context, we are distributed in Europe, in Alicante, Barcelona is the headquarters, Budapest, Madrid, Paris, Estocolm. So we are relatively big for an online travel agency, all sites. But we were, we were growing um, through the organic, normal organic growth, but also through mergers and acquisitions. And uh, that made us that we didn't concentrate enough on scaling up the way of working, right? So as a result of that, we had very slow product development process, which also had very long prioritization processes in place. Teams had to manage very complex dependencies across teams. We were not measuring capacity, capability, and we were asking the teams to come out with very awkward estimations. Sounds familiar, and we were delivering over 300 percent over time. That, for us, means very long lead times, loss of business opportunities, loss of revenue, very unhappy investors and stakeholders. So if that's so familiar, that's why we wanted to change. We wanted to become small again, small in the way of working, be quick and adaptive to market needs. So that's it. That was very easy. We acknowledge how we are and where we want to be. So what usually happens in these cases is that companies, we are very busy in operating the company day to day. So we ask consultants to come and do the work for us. So they do, they do come, these consultants, very smart, asking questions, and they draw a sad picture of your current estate. And back up with uh, a lot of uh, good armor comments be behind. And they also draw a future nice picture with a very linear path towards that, that if you action some actions that they can actually do for you, right? But one thing that we learn, you know, is that change creates chaos always. We have talked about that during the day today, several reasons why. So if this doesn't work, we were asking ourselves, what does, what does it work if real change is messy? So stepping back a little bit of looking at experts in their fields, we, we know we could learn from uh, Virginia Satire, for example, uh, a US uh, researcher that was telling us that any change, in any change there is a pattern where the change will meet resistance initially. That resistance then 
will be transformed into our, a curve where there is the acceptance and this acceptance then there is uh, a stabilization and that stabilization, that change is becoming your status quo and then all over again, meaning change, a new change, new resistance, a, a new step into a small chaos dip. So we knew in that we learned that we better do changes, but small steps. This is the key learning from that aspect, but also, you know, looking at other um, specialists like uh, Maslow, we, were, we needed to acknowledge that in any organization there is this uh, social hierarchy in place where, you know, everyone needs to or wants to belong to a team and wants to be good at what they do. So we also knew that from that aspect, this, breaking that social hierarchy, if we wanted to improve, that would also create resistance. And we would meet this type of people. Well, you sound familiar again. Now, from there, okay, we'll respect the social hierarchy, at least initially. And moving from another type of uh, special, we found that there is actually, we could try this uh, recipe where, for the change, where we could create a climate for a change, an urgency. And then, yes, we, need, we will need to engage the, the organization and implement the changes. But for us, just trying to create this climate was a no-no. Right? We didn't want to create any chaos or any sort of a strong sense of urgency to the company. So we found that there were no recipes, actually. But looking at deeply what we were doing, it is, you know, sound familiar for what we are saying. If we need to make small changes and we need to respect roles and responsibilities, you're talking about implementing Kanban. You have different Kanban principles. Right? We could start with what we do, we do now, and we could encourage acts of leadership at all levels. So this was our journey. Okay, we have a good idea that probably Kanban will do good for us. So what was our first step? That was already almost two years ago. Um, back then, we had this uh, organization where business functions and IT was very vertically structured. So we had to break these silos because that was what we had and we knew that it was creating the inefficiency in our processes. So we started creating cross-functional teams. And we started creating the concept of service teams. So for every single business function, it was, it was equipped with the different skill sets that I needed. It. And we had other type of teams, what we would call system teams or service teams, that would provide support to the rest of the organization. So these systems teams, they are the ones that uh, work on the maintenance, refactoring of the, of the different systems of the platform. So when we did that, we yes, we saw that had less dependencies, we know that we improved the coordination between teams, we improved the, transpar the transparency of the teams and the maintenance of the, of, the ma of the platform. So we had some happy people, but not everyone was happy. Everyone was happy because there was no direct relation between the business with the business outcome. We had business and IT and really was like a frontier. There was the business people thinking on achieving their, their budget, their objectives, and the IT people trying to deliver their projects. Right? When I need to, my, to deliver my project, I need to you know, deliver my objective. I don't know what you're talking about. This is the, uh, the relationship that we had. That's why we had some unhappy people. From that, then we realized, OK, let's, we need to do some more thinking about it. And what can we do? So we decided to visit other companies to learn. So we visit Google, we visit Booking.com, we visit Spotify and eBay, and trying to learn how they build their products. And from those visits, we had many insights. 
we share. <laughs> we had very you know, common denominators. We saw that in, in do, some of these companies, they had very autonomous teams, technically autonomy, and also in decision making. We, ha, we, we realized that some teams were actually had the space to create and innovate. And there, were, uh, there was a lot of transparency in those teams where we, were, we would uh, visit. And very much customer focus. So there was, those were the key learnings from, from those visits, from those uh, you know, uh, good companies that we, we, we visited. From, those, uh, from all those insights, then uh, we did an exercise on these keywords that would actually uh, create, become our sort of a transformation vision that we aspire to be. And for us, it is you know, a little bit difficult to remember, obviously, you know, the GEO strives to become an organization that rapidly develops, learns, innovates, and delivers great products to our customers. Seems a little bit easy and nice to put in, a, in somebody else's wall, but it was a lot to, uh, for us because if we would have done the same sort of exercise for the current state not long ago, we would see that, you know, we were very much focused on delivering optimizing value for our stakeholders. So back to our planning. Okay, we know now that we have the vision that we strive, the current conditions, which was cross-functional teams already, and we wanted to have autonomy, autonomy teams. We had the idea of, okay, if we started creating the organization with a product organization and empower the teams, to test how much, how far they can go technically, how far they can go taking their own decisions, this is the, the way to go. So we started with the organization. Instead of starting with architecture, because for us, we don't know what type of architecture we are going to need. So we had a high level roadmap where basically we said, OK, if we know that we we think we have the hypothesis that Kanban will work very well for us. We'll pick up three teams. We'll make some pilot teams. At the bottom, we said the scout teams. From there, we'll have a lot of learning that when we can apply and roll out to the rest of the organization while the, we do some changes and we learn and we understand the changes that we need to do in our architecture. So in order to engage the teams, set up the teams for flow, we started to recruit this team of Agile coaches. Um, part of that, I'm, I'm very proud. And I, we, uh, a change there is uh, that we didn't, they were not consultants. Uh, it was a full time job. So we did it, uh, we wanted to make a point to, to, a to send a message to the organization that the journey that we are going ahead, it is for some time. So again, we pick up three teams. And uh, we have around, as I said, around 30 teams or so. So we wanted to pick up teams that were very representative. So we picked up a team that is very much an activity-based team or project-based, very much with fixed scopes all the time and fixed delivery. Uh, we had a team that was, had the, the freedom to um, create their own features. And we have a third team that was like a mix. A mix of those two, right? I said, okay, so we'll pick up these three teams and we'll connect into the organization, train them to understand. We were talking earlier in other talks about giving them a purpose. So we were asking the teams to understand where is their mission, what is their purpose in the company, which type of a budget line they, they support, to understand also their different business KPIs. That's a challenge. And uh, when we started working with them, at the same time, that was around April, very handy that we understood that uh, David was coming out with the ESP training. So invi we invited David coming along. And we sent 25 people, key people of that product organization that we were building, to this training for five days to learn about enterprise service planning, to learn about better scheduling very forecasting to manage the work. So 
that had a, a, a very rapid change um, from all these people, even the people that we, the teams that we were engaging, plus all the rest of the teams that we were invited to the training. They all started to talk with the same language. They start, all started to start using randomly profile, risk profiling, right? And making decisions on that, understanding them for each, each, actually each, the different feature, the different risk profiling they had. So each team would start defining the different vectors that would make sense for them. And try to become very mathematical about it, saying, okay, so these are the different options that we have, and these are the different, you know, um, risk profiling that we assessment that we do. So just taking the time for you guys to take the pictures. I, okay. So we understood to say, okay, it is a major boost, this enterprise service planning to the entire organization, and also a, a good message to send. But we realized that we were still with the pilot teams, and we were going to the, through the basics, through the basics of Kanban. So in there, we, we met uh, and uh, leveraged from a, a model from uh, here, a friend, Frédéric Acoyance, which uh, uh, we, we, uh, we learned from it that it would give to the Agile coaches, it would give us a sort of a tool a sort of a checklist, a guide that we could use to engage the teams. So in this model, uh, we make it like three basic steps, three steps that all the teams go through, which is one, it is an assessment, two, it is a kickstart, and three is a boost phase. So for the assessment is when the Agile coach meets the team and understand who is whom, who does what, we ask the team to come out with a mission. We ask the team to come out with the business KPIs. And uh, after that, we go into the second phase, the kickstart, where we uh, go the team through some uh, Kanban training and the kickstart, which is designing the workflow. After that, we started the boost phase, which for every team, we learned that is very much a tailor-made solution. Some teams, they needed to start spending time understanding better shaping their demand to slice and dice all their work. And some other teams, we had to work with them to understand and better manage their dependencies. So this is what we did with the teams. Again, common training, sources of dissatisfaction, also leveraging from uh, Mike Burroughs, understanding the systems, basically, and setting up the team for flow. <laughs> These, uh, we saw some copycats, some teams that uh, we were not engaging that we're trying also to copy from what we were doing. And they're very creative where they had no wall spaces. They were using desks. So um, that was working very well. And uh, we saw also the need to, to, um, to invest part of our activities on something that we have talked today, which is uh, team's identity, Einheit, that we were saying. So we were doing some trivialism sort of activities. We were asking also the teams to identify what is their enemy, what is their common enemy. I hope to be outside the company, right? We are asking the teams to come out with their mascot, with their slogan. So as a result of that, we had like a common board like this one, right? Which is uh, of a system team where they, they call the, the VB chiefs. They had their own mission written down. They're trying to be the masters of the vacation product, supporting the different product teams that, that touches the vacation product. They have their mascot, clearly. They identify the different work types. They do understand the, the upstream. Sorry. They have the different uh, practices of the of Kanban, of course, with limits. Measuring, start measuring the throughput. Measuring there with chart, run charts, and the lead time distribution. And we started using elements like grumpy baby, or angry baby, I'll call it. So it is like a third person that we use, the Agile code uses to, when we see something that is not right doing with the team, to trigger the conversation, basically. So I'll walk you through uh, also through another, another Kanban board. I don't know why this is dark. 
But anyway, um, teams we're starting actually using to become very explicit, not only working practices, but on the different uh, feedback loops that they have, right? So if you're late, you pay a beer after four times, right? And start using uh, stop, starting, start, finishing, and make it explicit. So and their mission, again, in order to link them to business was very important. This team also has the Grumpy Gordon oops, to, to, as, as the, key, the, the key actor in there. Right. So we started also, started to, to receive the, the appetite to engage other types of uh, teams, not only product development teams. So we, we engaged, for instance, the service desk. Service desk that were dispatching work that comes in and out. Uh, for them, you know, their slogan was clear, a jeer and a party. And we started also fostering merchandising with the teams. So they have their slogan, they design the t-shirts, and they're, they design their pins. Metrics. Regarding metrics for us um, is very important because if we don't measure, we don't know if we improve. So in order to support the rollout, we're coming out with different tools, which I'll walk you through in a second. So again, from the engagement, we knew, we know at every given time, how many teams do we have in each phase? We, each Agile coach with the list of activities that we have, we can understand where we are. Sorry for the graphics. Once we have the presentation, it's much better. Uh, we leverage from, uh, from uh, Spotify that their teams health check and modify to ours. So we run this on a monthly basis and we see whether there is an element that increases or decreases that helps the Agile coaches plan their different activities through the month, right? So if we cross compare them, we can see some data that is whether if it's increasing or decreasing, uh, easy to release was one of the big pains, as you can see. Right. And another key topic in the, in the, in the survey was whether they felt if they were upon a player. That was important for us if we wanted them to achieve autonomy. We also ran quarterly surveys with the teams. And we start measuring um, some lead metrics. We start measuring lead time, local lead time, what we call whatever the you know the work, the, the time that the work item spends in, in a team out inside the team's boundaries. But we call that local lead time and also customer lead time, which is whenever they actually the, the customer receives the, the work item. So from that we measure uh, flow efficiency. Work time, the actual work time is spent divided by the, the, the calendar time. So this is uh, our current, this month, uh, flow efficiency, where we have from a point of view, the local uh, lead time on your right, which is, sorry, the customer lead time on your right, which is the 20% versus the 44 of the local on average for all the teams that we are engaging now, which is 25 teams. So we understood. Um, that 15% it is the average in the industry. And uh, these are these, these last month data after engaging them one year and a half. So we, can, we, we see that there is still, even though we, when we started, started working with them, we were like 2%. Now that we are at 20%, we see an increase, which, but still a lot of, a, a big gap still to catch up. Um, in order to measure the, the depth of Kanban, we came up with our own tool after trying several. Uh, one of our Agile coaches is very uh, technical, and uh, we saw that we could actually measure the depth of Kanban by having a scale from zero in the center to 100%. And for each one of the seven practices of Kanban, we could have like clockwise every three months, the view of the last three months. So we could see if there was increasing or decreasing, and the intensity of the color could see whether if the team has started working in it or has actually mastered it. Question. Uh, yeah, the all three oranges, for instance, right, is, is the same practice. So let's say if we, the same team, over time of the last three months. 
picture. So if we have that um, for all the teams, we can start seeing which teams actually need more help than others. This is a dashboard that we have and we use very much on the Agile coaches. On a monthly basis, we meet together and we have the hot seat where each Agile coach sort of explains one or two cases and go, because this is an assessment, a self-assessment uh, that the Agile coach does, right? So it's a little bit subjective for that matter. So we challenge that. And this is the, 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 the dashboard that we, that we have uh, displayed. Question? This, uh, this uh, uh, specifically, it is the Agile coach. The Agile coach is the one that makes the call whether the team has internalized it or is mastering it. So we, we tend to ask them to yourself, if I step away, will the team still do it? And actually we test that. Sorry, say again. If we evaluate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have tried several, uh, several um, um, maturity models that are out there. As I said, uh, we had the luxury of having an agile coach, which is very technical, very techy, and wanted to, to come out with this tool. So it's leveraging a little bit of the different tools that are out there already. About tooling. Um, we, we work with, uh, the organization worked with JIRA and, uh, we, through, during the pilot phases of the, the three teams, we attempted to, to test a new tool. So we did an assessment as well. We started working with the Swift Kanban actually there outside and uh, a very nice tool, excellent product providers, a lot, much, much more than what JIRA has, but again, we met resistance, the JIRA administrators obviously uh, saw that as a threat, as you know, we are scaling up this to the entire organization. We have been working for JIRA and implementing it is working. Let's try it with JIRA. So that was a valid point also. So we use JIRA today, but very much different from what we were using before. So the Agile coaches actually are have admin rights to define the different flows for the different teams and uh, modify part of the scripts to make the work types in different colors. Sorry for the definition. Uh, we use a plugin also of uh, Jira called EasyBI in order to measure those metrics, lead metrics that I said. The coach that you're talking about, are they dedicated to the one team? So they would be equivalent to like a scrum master or product owner that's on that dedicated team. Is the agile coach dedicated to the team? An Agile coach is dedicated to one team, but it's, it's dedicated to one to three teams. So they're not seeing all of the ceremonies and sitting there with the teams 100% of the time then? No, what we do, we, we usually do, we engage one team. An Agile coach engages one team, and it goes through the different phases. Mm -hmm. right? So until they go, until the boost phase, we are, not, we are not engaging a new team. So we spent a good month, if you may, with one team, assessing them, kick-starting, Making sure the the seven practices of Kanban are there, that the teams have their web limits, that the teams have the metrics especially set up. Right, so we work with the teams to understand what is the commitment point or what is the end point. So as soon as we have all the metrics and as soon as we start working with the boost phase, where we start with the upstream or the downstream, then if we, we start potentially have capacity to engage another team. But on average, we set ourselves that an agile coach could support to one to three teams. The the reality that we face is that some teams, they learn on different uh, speed. So one team that is very mature, you know, on the, on the different uh, depth of Kanban, we could actually leave them aside and have them support them on ad hoc basis instead of just being there. Uh, as for what you were saying to ensure that they have the ceremony rights and so on, uh, we, we have what we call the flow facilitator, which is a, a role, a virtual role. Once the team understands the different feedback loops that they have to go through and, and their work is, uh, you know, they're, they're, they have written the policies to that, the work agreements. Uh, each team has, you know, they, they rotate one member of the team for a certain time to do that, to ensure that the team 
does it daily so ensure that the team actually moves the work through the, the JIRA, et cetera. This is how we do it. And one other question. So for the 30 teams, are you guys having all uh, co-located? Or are they um, are some folks not sitting within the team space 100% of the time? No, uh, we do have um, an agile coach in uh, Stockholm that is supporting two teams. We do have three agile coaches in Madrid that is supporting uh, six teams. Uh, and the rest are basically in Barcelona, the rest of agile coaches, where between one to three teams. Uh, we really, uh, the agile coach uh, needs to be collocated, at least initially. Uh, it is true that for the Alicante teams, a service-oriented uh, teams that we have there, we have gone there, set them up, trained them, and so on. But we are doing the support on ad hoc basis from Barcelona. So predictability. Um, that, for us, is a game changer. As soon as we started helping the teams, as soon as we understand, make, uh, helping them understand the throughput, understand what is their capability. And the team starts doing forecasting, or reforecasting, is actually when the, the management started trusting the teams better. Right. And in order to do that, our hypothesis and what we are doing it is, we see the different teams as service teams. This is the concept of enterprise service planning. And even though most of the teams are cross-functional, there is a degree of dependency that we have with some of the system teams. So as soon as we start working with them, we start measuring them. As soon as we start measuring them, I start having the team understanding the metrics and making good use of that. Then we start asking them to come out with their SLAs. Once the team has an SLA and made it explicit, as we have seen in other talks, we can actually predict ourselves and we can plan that better. So this is what we do in order to, to manage dependencies. Obviously, that is supporting the fostering feedback loops and different working agreements. So a team that has usually a dependency with team A and B, they establish how they're going to work their dependencies. OK, so if I, if I realize or I discover that I have a dependency on you, we will work in a certain manner, I don't know, creating a copy of the JIRA ticket or just moving it into your backlog, et cetera. So this is what we foster but based on SLAs. So. Sorry, I'll repeat the question. Um, how centralized was your kind of effort to connect teams to each other? Did you allow teams to sort of locally figure out how to connect with each other, what the mechanism is, what it would look like, or did you try to roll something out a little more standardized? Um, we, we tried. Um, we are trying because we are still in it. <laughs> um, the Agile coaches are the ones that are facilitating initially. Right. So since we understand what is the, the team's tragedy and where how many uh, bottlenecks, how many dependencies we have, how we make them explicit, we connect them with the different teams, which they are already do anyway. Right? But we start setting up these working agreements between them and make them explicit. Uh, ESP cadences. Um, the previous uh, talk explained to them what they meant. I'm going to go. For us, as um, what we did, it is understanding them. We had already many in places. And what we have done, it is leveraging on them. So we were still keep using our names. As actually David was saying, we, some of these meetings, we already had them but with a different name, OPMs or OCM, the strategy meetings. OCM are the Origio chief management uh, people. So we already have them to some degree. And it's actually something that uh, we are working on to map them and revisit the purpose. So we do quarterly updates in order to inform the company of the progress what we are doing. Uh, we held lean coffees from time to time. We have meetups with the community to learn and share experiences. 
And um, I was asked, uh, I modified the presentation earlier, I was asked to provide us some insights on the challenges that we have had. Um, for us, one of them was connecting the, the teams with their business. Um, when you go to a team and, you know, uh, most, most of the teams, I didn't mention, but we had teams that were working, oh, some teams were very agile already. Some teams were working with Scrum, some teams were working with Kanban, with Proto Kanban, with uh, Waterfall Kanban, you name it. So uh, when we understand, we, we engage them and we start asking them for what is their purpose, what is their mission, and what is the business KPIs that they support, that is a challenge. Try to make people understand and changing the way of working and the behavior, so trying to understand that they are there for a, for a reason. Um, also eliminating what we call the handover culture. So we met the teams and obviously we were saying, okay, I'm just a developer, I'm not a QA, I'm not a tester, and vice versa. So that when we explain to them that from a helicopter view, obviously it's just a team. And what matters is that the work is done. So that you know, boundaries of the different roles starts to dilute a little bit. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, the, another challenge on a different level is keeping all the company informed. As soon as you start uh, doing the changes, you receive a lot of information and trying to be consistent on the way of uh, communicating. That was a challenge. And getting the metrics right getting uh, the metrics and make use of the metrics so the teams actually understand them and so on, also was a, a nice challenge and still is. Recommendations, uh, if we were to do it again, we would start uh, small, very, very small. Uh, we would involve more of the people in the organization. We had great support from uh, the sponsorship from the top, but we had to leverage from bottom up. So we probably would do it also differently and involve more of the people. Um, a lesson learned it is that once this starts going on, you don't drive the change. You maneuver it best. And uh, change takes time. We have been already now, that's almost two years and uh, since we started it. Next steps for us, several things. What we call the stabilizing teams. So we have engaged 25 teams. We still have quite a few to go. But we want to make sure that they don't fall back to the whole habits. So for us, one of the key sort of uh, goal that we have as agile coaches for this quarter is that it is helping the teams to come out with uh, SLAs. Establishing, uh, reviewing the, uh, uh, the cadences, that's another um, action that we have. Reviewing the portfolio, how we manage the portfolio. Expanding, expanding the Kanban to a business. We have now that we engage a large number of the organization. We have a lot of uh, requests for teams, also business teams, to, to be engaged. And um, the, 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 the key challenge that we have initiated already it is that the technical autonomy. So on working on continuous delivery. That is. So again, our roadmap, back again, it is where in continuous improvement phase, trying to work with architecture to support the, the, the teams. That's it, PSP Kanban, so for us it's a, a risk-free path to business agility. And thank you. <laughs> I think we have some time for some questions, if you wanted more questions. That's my catching skills. Um, so you, most of your coaches were uh, employees. They weren't consultants, correct? I, um, I heard you say we, that We before. had two internal uh, employees yeah. that uh, were promoted to Agile Coach because they were already doing that type of work. Uh, but uh, the rest, we recruit them from outside. Okay. So you hired in. Yes. Okay. Well, okay. So I was just, I was just going to ask you, how did you bootstrap that capability in the first place? And so you hired most of, some of the men and some you had. What was the size of the organization to the coach them? Um, so we have 400, 400 okay. engineers. And uh, we are 13 
sort of uh, agile coaches, but um, 10 of them actually worked with the teams at team level. I was curious to know, um, how was the collaboration between the teams? Did you find that teams started getting together a little bit more and talking about what they had in common as far as their approach to doing their work? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, there were there were already many feedback loops that they had in place. You know, from engineering side, we have architectures in the in the in the organization that actually evangelize and spread the word of uh, you know we have tech leads that also do that. So in the type of community of practice, uh, they were already doing that. We just foster that the, the communication, especially on the uh, on the dependency management and uh, from the product or product organization, the product owners, from the risk assessment type. So you showed a lot of great metrics. Um, how did the how did the business do overall? Did the you know you show a lot of Kanban metrics? Like how about like on on the business side, like whether it's revenue or however you measured, you know, since the since the whole business really was a part of this effort. Yeah, good question. It is a challenge. Um, but what we do, we have we have a strategy, and that strategy is meant to generate X amount of revenue. So from that strategy, it is if we have a business function, the the this business function may have two or three teams, four teams, you name it. Those different teams they have a mission to support the strategy and a business KPI. So that business KPI is actually the let's say the business outcome. If we is the conversion rate or is it uh, um, you name it. So this is the link that we do with the business. We don't we we struggle to 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 quantify if you if you may the future to actually the revenue that provides because uh, we are an online travel agency and there is a flow right on the booking flow and there are many teams that interact so actually to be precise on the revenue aspect at feature level uh, we haven't done that so far so we do it through the business KPI. Uh, can you please uh, talk a little bit about uh, the roles and behaviors of managers at DGO and how it changed uh, throughout your story? Thank you. Um, <laughs> good question. Yeah, um, we, because we started this small with three teams, and um, those teams we, we were having to talk to their business counterparts and explain them to them the different uh, roles changes. So we were introducing a product owner where before there was a business owner actually that would provide the, uh, let's say, what the team has to do. So obviously, uh, we, we, what we had done it is to talk to them both and uh, make them understand that what is important it is that they made to a common agreement. That we, where we expect that 95% of the times they come to a common agreement, and if there is a, dif uh, a difference, the last call is for the product owner to make. Right. That was because that's the role that, that the, the ultimate responsible. So behavior changes is that that the some business teams um, had to actually were a little bit. We met some resistance on on doing that because from one day to another. But at the same time, we saw also some business people that was very happy to actually give that responsibility away from them. Um, so it's a mixture. In terms of behavior, I think that helping the teams, enabling the teams to come up with the same tools and the same uh, language, when they use risk profiling, that they all talk the same language. They're all business and actually product owners are talking table stakes, voice spoiler, et cetera. That, uh, that is the, 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 the big uh, change that uh, provided to them. One more last question. You talk a little bit about a difficulty in communicating to the entire company as one of the challenges. Can you talk a little bit about what steps you guys take to overcome that communication? Yeah, as soon as we started uh, thinking, 
not even doing. We started uh, already receiving some of uh, heads up. Hey, I don't know what you're doing, guys. Why do you don't communicate better? We didn't even start it. But um, so what we do in order to to foster communication, we use uh, we use uh, the company has a communication department. So we have intranet. So on a weekly basis, they say something about it. Uh, we created our own uh, blog inside the company where initially it was just first a few of us, then the entire teams that are engaged that talks and post on a weekly basis, uh, sharing the learnings that they have done. You know, team A is doing is working on these features or uh, reforecasting and so on. So that make a big uh, difference in the, the box, the, the blog thing. Then we support it, as we said, on uh, doing uh, lean coffees. So with actually people that they didn't understand, they would come and ask uh, about uh, questions about concepts. And, um, and I think that you know, between the quarterly, we do a survey quarterly basis. Well, so we send it to the entire business organization to ask them how, if they perceive how, how the, the change is going. And if they, you know, we receive very good insight from there. So this is what we do, surveys, uh, measuring them, uh, sharing the, the, the lessons learned, and different activities like that. Okay, that's it. Time up. Thank you.